are live. Welcome to 1977's Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, Review and Thoughts. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, that guy who wrote and directed THX 1138 and American Graffiti brought the space opera back to the silver screen in the subgenre's first feature film and changed the face of cinema forever. THX 1138 and American Graffiti are two great movies, to be sure. I'm just saying, he's not who you'd expect to direct anything like this. Yeah, I'm kind of passionate about at least some of the Star Wars movies. Now, re returning viewers might have noticed that the camera angle is different. I have gotten some feedback that the volume was too low on some of these videos, so I tried moving the camera close. I already did that somewhat, but I wasn't completely happy with how... Yeah. So, I think this might be the one I am settling on. I realized this, I realized this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth the time. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Now, let's see. So, yes, I start this video with a review, most likely zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself and get into the thoughts sections, Please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. I will not be spoiling later entries in the franchise. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content for this movie. Torture, xenophobia, murder, and genocide. Oh, and kidnapping. Now, the MPAA rated this PG for sci-fi violence and brief mild language. The, the rest of the, the, yeah, the video is also rated PG. I'm not going to be making some of the more... creative jokes for mature audiences in this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I streamed this movie. I didn't have, so I didn't have to pay extra. Yeah, I pay the same for streaming, whether I watch zero movies a month or hundreds. So I didn't pay anything extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video about it. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. And you don't need to have watched any other movie before watching this. Now... When I do a video on a movie that is a little older, I try to put myself in the mindset of someone from that period experiencing it for the first time back when it originally came out. And... <clears throat> yeah, so, once again, please note that while I'm aware many people have watched this movie, probably most, this review will be based on the idea that you haven't. That's right. If you're not already familiar with this franchise, this video is for you. This is your lucky day, both of you. Now, I'm not saying that I have some incredible new revelation about this. Part of the reason I'm doing this review is that, you know, I've tried to collect as much information as I could on as many different aspects of the film that I've heard over many years from many different sources and it's possible that there are other videos out there that have collected all this information in one place 
and I just haven't watched those videos. But that's the idea with, with this one. Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. I also may wipe my face with a cloth, but that cloth isn't going near anyone else. Now, I base this review on the version on Disney Plus. Now, I had read that it, you know, the version on Disney Plus fixes a lot of the bad changes that George Lucas made in more recent editions. You know, even though it would not be the original theatrical cut. I'm not sure, it, it might be a, based on country, I don't think the version I saw was, you know, several, some of the things that are in the movie are things that I've heard others criticize from some of the more recent, back when George Lucas still, you know, was making changes to it, so. The... The following is too vague to understand if you don't already know what I'm talking about. So I'll just say Han leans slightly to the side in the version that I saw. So, yeah. But, you know, if you are in a country where the Disney Plus version has fixed, you know, things, obviously the Disney Plus version is the one that I would recommend. I don't have an exact count for how many times I've watched this, somewhere in the dozens. I first watched this in the mid to early 2000s. I'm actually not sure, did I watch this at all before the prequel? I think The Phantom Menace had come out when I first watched this. And, yeah, I first watched this movie years ago. For many years I didn't have access to it, now I have access to it again. That's why I'm doing a video on it now. Otherwise, I would have done it years ago, but the last time I had access to it was before I was doing videos. Let's see. And I'd also, I'd like to note, I was not a child when I first watched this. I was a teenager, a very jaded teenager, and I will admit that on the first viewing, it wasn't... It didn't... It, it wasn't really my kind of thing. It wasn't really that it was so old, because I already liked movies from the 70s, not to mention the 60s and even the 50s. But when I went back and rewatched it a few years later, I started to appreciate it more. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say that the only way you'll love a movie like this is if you watched it when you were a child. And it's nostalgia, so I just want to clarify, that is not the case for me. I love this movie, and it is not nostalgia. It is based on its actual qualities when compared to other movies from the same time. So, plot. I'm going to try to put it as simply as I can, because if I get into the details, this can take a while. So, yeah. Set long ago and far away. I'm not 100% certain if he's supposed to be a teenager or just barely an adult, but Luke Skywalker has to get together a team and rescue Princess Leia. Countless lives depend on it. Now... So this, according to IMDb, this is an action-adventure fantasy sci-fi. The action is fun and exciting, it's not ashamed of the fantasy roots, and the sci-fi set a new standard, you know, for, for how much action and how great effects you could expect from a sci-fi movie. You know, bef uh, when, when, you, when you do research on this, like, when they were making it, they were a little worried because sci-fi movies were not held in high regard. They didn't do very well. And, you know, like, so, some, of the, some of the marketing tried to focus on, oh, you know, there's sort of a romance between Leia and, you know, and... Because they were, they were worried that the movie would completely tank. And, you know, I'll... It, there have been ups and downs in the genre, but, yeah, this was, this was one of the movies that really 
made it clear that the you could make really incredible science fiction movies. Now, let's see. Now, George Lucas both wrote and directed this, and as I've already hinted, he basically wanted to put the space opera back on the big screen. He remembered Flash Gordon short films in theaters. He wanted to bring that back and make a feature-length movie like that. And actually, before he made his own thing with it, before he created Star Wars, he wanted to make a movie out of Flash Gordon, but he couldn't get the rights, and so he had to get creative. I don't... I, th I think I read it, but I, re I, f I forget. I forget who had the rights, but I want to extend my deepest, sincerest thank you for not letting George Lucas just direct a Flash Gordon movie. I'm, I'm not super familiar with that, but I know enough about it to know that it would not have been as groundbreaking as Star Wars, you know, even considering that a lot of people didn't remember about Flash Gordon, but like, once he started making his own thing, he put so many different things into it that just, yeah. You can think of space opera like soap opera, but bigger, more grand, more spacious. Before this movie, nothing that had already come out was quite like Star Wars. Nothing looked like Star Wars, and we're talking settings, machines, vessels, costumes, aliens, weapons, special effects. Nothing sounded like Star Wars. You know, everything has a unique sound to it in Star Wars, and there are all these alien languages that just, like, it's it's wild. It is a huge, like, it's, it's like, when you think about it, if you go far back, like, I'm not 100% sure. They might have stopped doing this sometime in the 1950s, but in the 19... No, wait, no. Didn't they also do it in the Planet of the Apes movies, which are from, like, the 60s and 70s? So, American science fiction before Star Wars, it's possible that there was some other, but a lot of the time, aliens spoke English, and they basically looked like humans a lot of the time. Like... They'd have weird stuff on their foreheads and, and such, but that would basically be it. And just Star Wars really opened the door, really proved, no, people will go see, you know, people will flock. Millions of people will pay theater price tickets to see a movie where, like, I mean, I didn't count, but let's see if I can real quick, let's see, there's the... Off the top of my head, there's at least four different alien languages in this movie that are not subtitled. Like, you'll maybe get another character reacting to it, and sometimes they'll be like, I can't believe you just said, and that's a, that's a bit awkward, obviously. But a lot of the time, like, the movie kind of just acts like, you know, you're, you're not... It, it acts less like it's... A movie that's supposed to inform you about the things that you're you're witnessing and more like it's just you know like they kind of plucked a movie out of some other culture far far away they know you know like like there there's plenty of movies where like there are multiple languages and they aren't subtitled like it you know I've, I've seen at least one movie that has both English and Spanish spoken in it. And it was basically made by people who are bilingual, so they were like, people speak, and and some, I think there's also, there's there's also some movies where it's just context clues, you know, you can you can piece together basically what was said. But, yeah, in, in this one, like, you, you legitimately don't know exactly what they are saying, and it is, just, it has a, a really great effect. Just to... Yeah, it, it really makes it feel alien. 
th this amount of world building, so many different alien cultures and languages were never featured in just one movie. Like the the thing is, like if you, you know, today Star Wars is big, but when it came out, like if you sit down and try to pick it, pick the movie apart. There's enough for several movies in just this one movie, and that was something that really resonated with people. Like, finally a movie that doesn't act like we, we have to be spoon-fed everything. Like, everything has to be... Yeah. Now. Yeah, so the the... Yeah, the, the, um, yeah, IMDb is more like this list, compares this to the other Star Wars movies, you know, which, yeah, to briefly, you know, compare, it, it says you might also like The Empire Strikes Back, which for me is a 10 out of 10, Return of the Jedi, which I'll, I'm going to reevaluate it when I watch it because it has been years. Maybe I'll feel differently, but the last time it was a six out of ten for me. The prequels are in the five to seven out of ten range, and it also compares it to the Lord of the Rings, which for me are all perfect ten out of ten. And Back to the Future Part One, which is an eight out of ten for me. And on Disney Plus, it also you know, recommends other Star Wars films and recommends The Mandalorian. I would say, personally, my favorite. I I love this and I love Episode Five, and they are really like I feel like this one does an incredible job of introducing us to this world, and The Empire Strikes Back delves a little deeper into certain aspects of it and I th I think it was smart to like basically when George Lucas wrote this movie he had ideas that he later put into both the the you know episode 5 and 6 but also episodes 1 2 and 3 and just the the he could have put the stuff he put in empire into this movie and I think it would have ended up being kind of bloated which as it is I don't think it is it, it could very easily have ended up like that but the the yeah I I think he, he did a, it, it was very it was the right decision to to remove some stuff from this and put it back in for Empire Strikes Back now, I would definitely say George Lucas, when he made this, he was really, he wanted to prove that he could do something like this and that something like, something like this could do well, which a lot of people didn't think that it could, you know, like, Essentially, yeah, part of it was he remembered Flash Gordon shorts. You know, if, yeah, for, for those who might not know, it used to be that they would show a, you know, they, they'd show shorts, in, including like old Looney Tunes shorts. Like if you see a Looney Tunes shorts today from like 1950 something, Maybe it originally did play before a movie. You know, got to remember that TV was not back then what it is now, or what it was. I, I guess today it's streaming. That's the the standard. But anyway, you know, Looney Tunes and these space opera shorts. You know, and the fact that they stopped showing the shorts. As far as I understand, it wasn't really that audiences were like, okay, enough with the shorts. We get it. We just want to watch the movie. There were... Uh, 
yeah, see, I didn't, I didn't write down a history of, it's probably on Wikipedia though, but basically they just, they, they moved away from that. Might have been that movies were getting longer, and so audiences, or maybe it was that audiences no longer wanted to stay as long, maybe it was, you know, you can only show, there can only be so many showings if you're showing, you know, they, they were also, they would show double features, they would show two movies in a row, which significantly limits how many showings you can do in a, in a day when, if you just show one movie, no shorts, you know, maybe some trailers and ads, just, yeah, but he missed them, you know, they, they didn't really survive, like Looney Tunes survived, although, you know, they, they didn't, the, there was, it's, there, there's, there's a difference between, you know, appearing before big movies and then just airing on TV, but the, the space opera shorts and, you know, other shorts, I think Batman and Robin were also among them, they didn't really, did they survive sh briefly on television and then it didn't really, they, they certainly were gone by the time that George Lucas wanted to make this movie and he realized, you know, he can't make, like, if, if he just makes a short, that's not going to get shown in theaters. So he made an entire movie and he decided to kind of show that there could, there could be more. You know, it, it wasn't just, like, I, I'm not 100% certain exactly how long, I, th I think I used to know, but, yeah, they were short films, they, it was maybe 20 minutes, and it would continue, you know, the one you saw wouldn't necessarily be the first, and it would end on a cliffhanger, and then you'd have to watch the next short, you know, watch another movie in theaters. And the, the, yeah, obviously that, that, that is part of why it got to be kind of silly. You know, they, they had to prove, they had to make up a cliffhanger every 20 minutes or so of story, you know, and the effects weren't particularly good for the, you know, I mean, I mean, they were, they were acceptable for when it was made and for it just being short films but you wouldn't want to sit and watch two hours in a row of that, so Lucas also knew that the effects had to be a lot better, and it actually kind of, like, this create, this, when they made this movie, they created Industrial Light and Magic, because there just, it, there wasn't really anything there that could handle this many effects of this high quality for one movie, and it, it took them a long time to get all of it done, you know, the movie, I think, was at least slightly delayed because of how much time, like, they, they spent a really long time and a lot of money on the special effects, and I have I have only seen versions after 1997, so I don't know exactly what the old effects looked like, but I've heard from people who have seen it that it was still really, really good, even before the the fixes, you know. The the I, I'm not talking about the the new stuff that he added, but he like removed you you could see a little like see you could sometimes see the seams where the effects start start and end, and that was covered up in 1997 the special editions. Let's see, I was getting to something. Was it just right? Right, and the the fact that it was you know that that you would watch one of these shorts, and you would know it's not the only one. It's not a complete story. As far as I understand, Lucas basically always wanted to call this episode four, but at first, the like the the, the people who, you know. Yeah, there, there were some people who had the you know influence to, to prevent that, and they were like, there's no way we're telling people 
that this is not the first. No, 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 that doesn't work today. You have to just call it the first. And I think it's from 1981 that it's been known as Episode 4. And yeah, you know, once people fell in love with the movie, they did want more, including stuff that took place before it. You know, it didn't really scare people away, although it's possible it would have if they had gone into it knowing that this was not going to be the only one. But yeah, people wanted more. And this was actually also one of the movies that showed that sequels can be a good thing because when they made this one like they were they they were worried that people would think you know they they didn't want to do too much sequel baiting because they were worried that yeah you know back, back then people sequels had a bad rep which makes a lot of sense when you look at some of the ones that were and, and most of the good sequels that have been made came out after this one. Not all of them. Technically speaking, The Godfather Part 2, 1974, is a sequel. It wasn't planned when they made the first one. The first one was retroactively called The Godfather Part 1. So that, you know, but that's, it's one of the rare sequels that came out. Anyway, I decided to review this because Disney Plus has every single Star Wars movie, so I officially no longer have any excuse not to review the franchise. Certainly the films, I think I will go for maybe some of the shows, like Clone Wars, I'm definitely strongly considering. I'm almost definitely going to do The Mandalorian. There's so few episodes of The Mandalorian that it's, it's not a huge undertaking. And yes, I am doing all the movies. You know, as I record this, there are 11 that have been released. There's a 12th on the way. There are three trilogies, two standalones. There's a third standalone on the way. I'm doing in them in the order that they were released. I'm aware that there are those out there who would say that you should watch them in chronological order, you know, in the order that they are set. I disagree with this idea simply because there are things depicted in some of the films that are set earlier than some of the others that I don't think should have been, you know, I, given that they did come out after, I think that's fine. It's not what I would have done, but whatever. I don't think you should watch them. I don't think you should start by watching episode one. I do think you should watch episode four, five, six, one, two, three, and then seven, eight, nine. And, and the standalones, let's see, episode 7, what's the first standalone, row, row 1, I think, episode 8, Ep yeah, right, no, I had it right, episode 8, Han Solo, and then, or, so, Solo, let's just call Solo, and sometimes a Star Wars story, and then finally episode 9. And the first time that I watched this movie, it was because the school had decided that everyone in class was going to watch it. I did, like I knew of it. Obviously, I knew what a lightsaber was. Like I, I don't. If you're at least seven years old, you probably know what a lightsaber is, even if you haven't watched it. You know. I'm pretty sure I had watched, I, I had played a little bit of some of the games. I've, you know, I haven't played all the games because there are like a metric ton of them. Now, the movie takes elements from a number of different genres. Han Solo is almost a space pirate, not, not quite technically, but yeah, he's, he's a smuggler but bordering on space pirate. He acts like a cowboy from a western sometimes. Luke is an everyman who goes on the Joseph Campbell hero's journey. You could say there's an element of a fairy tale in this young man going to a building where there are evil beings so he can rescue a princess. Obi-Wan Kenobi is like this mix between like a samurai and a monk. There's a conflict between fascists and a resistance movement. 
there's swashbuckling, romantic tension, good versus evil, myth and legend. Like, basically, everything that George Lucas thought he could put in the movie and that he liked, he put in the movie, and the movie's all the better for it. Now... So, let's see, the, um, yeah, George Lucas wrote this, and the other movies that I've seen that he wrote are the, yeah, basically, you know, episodes 1 through 3 and 4 through 6, THX 1138, and American Graffiti. As I mentioned in the intro, basically nobody expected George Lucas to make this kind of movie when he did. Today, when we think of George Lucas, Star Wars is one of the first things that, first things that comes to mind, possibly the first. He's excellent at writing compelling concepts and does a really good job of writing in numerous different philosophies, but his dialogue writing definitely had has issues. I'll get to that when I get to the dialogue section. And yeah, you know, um, among the concepts that this had, you know, that that were really powerful. The Death Star is a space station that is extremely powerful. Right there, you already have something that grabs your attention, and it is featured on at least some of the posters. The Jedi have a religion which has ideas that in real life come from New Age, Zoro, Zoroastrianism, Navajo beliefs, and Taoism, I think is how you pronounce it. And, yeah, like, all the different characters feel distinctly different. They come from different worlds, they have different beliefs, different approaches to situations, and they're frequently introduced in a way that does a good job defining them. Some, something I will talk about when I get to the characters. Some people will walk away really thinking about adopting some of these philosophical ideas, and others will simply enjoy a fun adventure. But you don't have to... Like, the, the movie doesn't need you to take in all of the concepts. Like, if you're seven and you watch this it's good guys versus bad guys but you know if you're in your 20s or 30s you maybe look at some of the things that are described like what do you know the 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 evil entity here is the galactic empire as the the opening crawl just call them the evil galactic empire and we're told some of the things they do in in addition to the death star you know a seven-year-old can easily understand, oh, you know, it's really destructive. They're, they're going to kill a lot of people. That's bad, obviously. But if you're an adult, you might look at, you know, some of the things they say that... Yeah, some of the things they, they describe doing, wanting to do, having done, and, yeah, it's... You know, there, there are some movies that a child might enjoy some of, but when it comes to, like, plot and such, that are going to be lost. This one, you, you can follow it. Like, I can imagine, again, having not watched it as a child, I can imagine that if you watch it as a child, some of the dialogue you'll probably just kind of have to suffer through. You don't really, you know, you're, you're not yet really mature enough to completely process some of these ideas but you never have to suffer through very much before there's something that's going to really appeal to a child you know such as all these different alien designs you know and the the action and yeah now yeah this is the kind of movie where it doesn't really explain. The, there's a lot that goes unexplained here, 
you're basically supposed to accept the world as it is presented and I think that really works well for the movie. It, the movie would have had to drop a ton of stuff if everything was to be explained and you know today like when this movie came out at first people thought there wasn't going to be more you know there, there were like there were comic book adaptations there were novelizations that had some more details but at first it didn't you know the, the movie itself doesn't promise that there's going to be more whether movies or video games or what today you know let's see the movie is what let's see 23 21 yeah, 43 4 44 years old today there's a lot of star wars you know like if you if you take in all of the the other stuff like you can probably read a story about like the guy who cleans the floors of the death star like there's it's it's ridiculous how much there is when it came out you basically just had to accept it and i mean today you essentially have the choice of like you can follow the movies without having gotten into any of the ex extended universe stuff not expanded universe extended universe and it's it's basically up to you or you know possibly you might get pressured into it depending on who you watch Star Wars with but yeah you know it's it's I, I really really like that it is just it's there and you can you can imagine it's it's a very stimulating movie that really puts images in your head and then your mind can try to figure out like there's a there's a character in this who says that like the, uh, yeah there's there's a character who says that his establishment doesn't allow droids or robots inside and you know it's a, it's a little throwaway thing but apparently someone wrote the backstory for why he is you know like anti robot and yeah, it's 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 there, and you can either choose personally. Like I've played some of the games. I don't think I've read. No, I haven't read any books or comics. And I've really only watched the stuff that is explicitly in continuity. I don't get the sense that George Lucas just didn't want to bother with an explanation. I do get the sense that he wanted to present a world that for many reasons just did not line up with what we knew to be scientifically possible scientifically or historically. Like, even today, you know, 44 years later, traveling very far through space just does not seem feasible. No technology we have makes that anything less than something that will take an enormous amount of time and resources. And in this movie, people travel between planets the way we travel between countries. I mean, sure, you maybe need the right vehicle for it, and someone who could pilot it properly, but beyond that, it's really not that big of a deal. And that just, again, like, immediately, like, you're, oh, wow, if we can travel between planets, we could go to all these different, and, and it's also, you know, if, if traveling between planets was extremely difficult in the Star Wars universe, there would be substantially less varied alien life, you know. So many science fiction movies start by telling the audience where we are in relation to Earth, in relation to human beings. What year is it? Based, of course, on how we count it on Earth. And that's not even mentioning all the ones where, despite it being science fiction that takes place in space, some of the most important characters are human beings. I really love that we get so few details in this one. When is it taking place? A long time ago. Where? In a galaxy far, far away. I'm not 100% sure it even comes out and says that the characters in this movie that look human to the viewer actually are human beings, much less human beings from Earth. Like, basically, they didn't have the budget, and it would have been a huge hassle 
for every character to look completely alien. But they aren't actually especially based on human beings. They just happen to look a lot like them. You know, I, I think I did see somewhere where someone tried to make it seem like, oh, you know, technically they are just like human beings. Personally, I think it's incredibly boring for Star Wars to be, to, to have much of a connection to Earth. I, the, the way I see it, you know, like, given how massive the galaxy is, or the universe, I forget which is bigger, I don't think it's a huge stretch to imagine that there's at least one more planet out there where beings that at least look a lot like human beings were, you know, that, yeah, evolved. Not were evolved, but did evolve, I mean. Yeah, I think, like, at one point, Han Solo says human being, but he's actually kind of being sarcastic. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure it's even said other than that. And characters kind of just take for granted that, like, Luke hasn't left his home planet of Tatooine when we meet him. He, he wants adventure, but he's never really seen anything far away from himself. They go, you know, yeah, he, he goes to this place that has just this, like, I'd say at least a dozen different alien species. And he's not, like, freaking out, like, wow, look at all these aliens. There's one there, 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 you know. I've never seen anything like this. He just kind of accepts it. And and that's basically like in this universe when when you meet someone new, they might you know, maybe they look like a human being, but maybe they're an alien, maybe they're a robot, you know, all these different ver you know p possibilities and the characters just kind of treat it like it's ev like the the it's it's essentially acting as though it's ethnically diverse, which sadly isn't in real. You know, there's it's mostly white people, but yeah, like it's ethnically diverse, and it it's about people who grew up in an ethnically diverse setting. The movie handles plot twists very well. There are not too many. They're not bad. They're not too few. They're not too easy to figure out for the viewer. It's not difficult to keep up with all the twists on the first viewing. And it's not a movie you need to watch more than once in order to follow it. But it's it's extremely rewatchable because you can... Yeah, you can wonder about different aliens, you can, you know, try even harder to figure out exactly what does, what is the alien trying to say here, and these kinds of things. Now, as mentioned, this was directed by George Lucas, and yeah, other than this and the, the prequels, the only movies I've seen that he's directed are THX 1138 and American Graffiti. And, like, supposedly Lucas was always giving the direction faster, more intense. I'm sure it must have been incredibly repetitive to hear, but it worked out really well. He really does keep things moving throughout this, like, it, it never feels like it's really slowing down. Again, obviously, if you watch it for the first time today, you've got to put yourself in the mindset of someone. It, you know, the pacing is good for 1977. It's not good for 2021. You know, if, if you want something that moves as fast as movies today do, then this is not for you. George Lucas took a break from directing after this because he was so exhausted about it. He didn't direct again until The Phantom Menace, which came out 22 years after this, and he was directing it about 19 years after this. 
Now, the very first shot of the movie is outer space, and we see this, like, moderately sized spaceship flying through space whilst being attacked, and then gradually we see the frame utterly filled by a massive ship that is the one attacking the, 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 the smaller one, and immediately we get a sense of the evil galactic empire as this massive destructive force. It's really impressive as just... Yeah, no, no one has seen anything like this. Like, just the, the idea of, of a spaceship that basically filled the frame. Because, you know, why not? We do that with stuff that's real. So why not do it with stuff that's fictional as well? You know, and, and just nobody had really... The, yeah, I, I think it was a combination of the fact that Nobody had the audacity to do it, and the effects work. Like, I can understand why you didn't want to get that close to a model, you know, in like the 60s. Because some of those really did not hold up to, to such close scrutiny. And the, the first real scene, we see the stormtroopers of the evil Galactic Empire board the smaller ship and kill the troops on it. And... Again, it just really gives a strong sense of them as this, like, it, it, if you try to run, they will catch you, and when they catch you, they will kill you. So, immediately, like, the, the first thing in the viewer's head is, someone has to stop those guys. Characters in this have to stop the Empire, and... You know, like, if you've never watched it, like, just, if you if you tried watching the rest of the movie, but without seeing that as, as the start, it just wouldn't have the same effect. But it really, it tells you just how big of a deal the Empire is. Yeah, the, the movie immediately introduces us to the conflict and several of the main characters, good and evil alike. And the movie opens with the now famous opening crawl, which was a very subversive way to open a movie back then. One of the countless subversive traits of this. And then the camera pans. It was already looking at space, and now it's looking in a slightly different part of space. And it is apparently the first pan in space in a movie. And I I do want to briefly talk about like the opening crawl is basically perfect the way it is. Like it is absolutely incredible. It gives you just enough information and it gives you the right information. You know, you don't end up spending forever just waiting for all the text to go by so that the movie can start. You know, you didn't you didn't sit down to sit and read for two hours. You want the movie to start. So I really appreciate because I've I've seen like I've seen an older version of the the opening crawl. And there was way too much information that, like, there was information that, some, some of this information you get later in the movie, and by the time you get it, you're more ready for more information. And some of it, it's just not, like, I, I would say everything they removed from the opening crawl, it was wise of them to remove it, because it really, it would have been way too much, it would have, and, and apparently, like, they, they, test, they screen tested it, and, you know, people were like, it's just, it, there's way too much text in the opening crawl, you've got to do something about that. And it's, it's one of those things where, like, George Lucas was super stoked on all this lore. So he, he had a difficult time imagining what it would be like to read the opening crawl for someone who had no idea what any of this was and once he got some help with trimming it down it's huge improvement 
I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it it fits with what came before. I personally love the ending. It doesn't have Deus Ex Machina. Is there convenient writing? Not especially. It, it largely follows stuff that was already established. And it is also, you know, if you if you watch this and then you, like, th this is the only Star Wars movie that is truly self-contained. You can, you can sit down and watch this and not go for the, the sequels or prequels. But if you start on some of the other ones, you kind of do have to keep going in order to get the, the full story. But... Yeah, this one, like, hypothetically, you know, maybe there's some other universe out in the multiverse where there is only one Star Wars movie, and it's not full of people saying that the plot threads of the Star Wars movie went unresolved. So, yeah, that's... It's, it's wild that they managed to... Now, some viewers feel that parts of the ending are too small and other parts go on for too long. I can see what they mean. I think that if you go into the movie without the, the weight of expectation, which I realize today is extremely difficult, then I don't think that it feels too small. I suppose I could understand, yeah, there, there are definitely people who, who think that another aspect of the ending goes on for too long, and it's, yeah, I, I, can, I can see what they mean. Personally, I do love it, but an argument could be made that it should have been trimmed down at least somewhat, but, but this... You know, Star Wars today, like, with cultural osmosis, it's impossible. Everybody knows at least something about Star Wars. You know, when back when I was still with my now ex-fiancé, then fiancé, I showed her the original trilogy, and I'm not sure there was really anything in the movies that she didn't basically already know. Like, she'd seen, you know, I already mentioned lightsabers, but all of these different, you know, because of all the, the references and discussion of it, and yeah. Now, let's see, the, and the ending, the ending credits is very strong, like the, the music really swells. The movie never loses your interest along the way. It does a good enough job of keeping things moving with the good guys working towards defeating the bad guys and every so often showing us the bad guys, reminding us of the stakes and such. And... So, yeah. The... The Jedi can use the Force, which allows certain psychic abilities. I'm not going to give spoilers for it here. It uses the powers well. Let's see. The, the use is not like excessive. It's easy to follow. There isn't too much. Now, that brings us to the characters and for some of the characters the movie simply isn't going to tell you that much and you know I, I know some some people find it difficult to get into a movie where you just aren't told very much about the characters and sadly that means that this is one of those movies that some people won't be able to get very much into and there's also some characters that are not, like, there are aspects to them that make them harder to like. So, if that means you can't get into the movie, I'm afraid this is a movie you won't be able to get into. 
and it definitely you you feel empathy for Leia and Luke and deep searing hatred for Vader and Darth Vader and Grand Moff Tarkin. I think whether or not you feel empathy for Han Solo and Obi-Wan will depend like some people will but others won't. Mark Hamill plays Luke Skywalker and yeah he was raised by his aunt and uncle on Tatooine he dreams of something more than his current life early on he can be a little annoying because he complains he's introduced complaining to his uncle about like basically chores but you know Hamill himself has, has said you know it was like he intentionally Yeah, the actor intentionally chose to make the, the character start out as very immature and childish so that by the end of the movie when he's, you know, when he's, he's grown more, there was, there was room for growth. And like he, he is a farm boy at the start so like it is he's incredibly easy to relate to for not, not specifically for the farm thing but the fact that he is basically nobody really expects him to do or become something amazing like he's expected to stay at the farm and to take over the farm once his uncle and aunt are too old to take care of it, to handle it themselves and yeah like if you're if you're a teenager it is extremely easy to relate to how he just wants to he wants to get out of there he wants to get away from his home and experience something exciting and he's also he cares about the the what's the word the the fight between the Galactic Empire and the Rebel Alliance. He wants to become a rebel with a cause. And Harrison Ford plays Han Solo, a cynical smuggler hired by Obi Wan Luke to take them to Alderaan in his ship the Millennium Falcon co-piloted with Chewbacca. He takes some convincing before he'll help but he is an incredible pilot and he's introduced talking to Luke and Obi-Wan about flying them and you really get a sense that he's been like he's been doing this for a really long time and he's kind of like it takes a lot to impress him. It takes a lot to really. And Carrie Fisher, RIP, played Princess Leia Organa, Princess of the Planet Alderaan, who was a member of the Imperial Senate and secretly one of the leaders of the Rebel Alliance. She's a very strong character, very intelligent, tactical, tenacious. She's easily one of the most capable of the good guys. I really appreciate that the main featured woman is like that. You know, she's introduced fighting off stormtroopers despite being alone against them where she is. And sadly, not long after that, she is captured. But in capture, no matter how dangerous the situation is, she's never afraid of criticizing her enemies right to their face and obviously if she can actually fight them that's what she'll do but like Darth Vader and Grand Moff Tarkin like he he will tell them to their face you know the the she'll she'll call them cowards and say that they're completely out of line and, and stuff.
and Peter Cushing, RIP, played Grand Moff Tarkin, the commander of the Death Star, and He makes a really excellent villain as this sort of, yeah, you, you really, you hate his guts. He is so despicable and, and it, it is this thing, like sometimes movies that are accessible to children have villains that are really buffoonish so that they don't scare the children, but he is very capable. And Alec Guinness, R.I.P., played Obi-Wan Kenobi, an aging Jedi Master, veteran of the Clone Wars, who introduces Luke to the Force. And he's a very wise, patient mentor. He's introduced, like, right when you meet him, he his head is covered by a hood. And at first, like, some of the good guys were, like, looking at him, like, oh, who's, who's this guy? Scary. Hood, you know. And then he takes off the hood, and he has this, this smile, and he says, don't be afraid, little, little friend, or something like that. Uh, yeah, he's just, you, you really, you trust him. Anthony Daniels played C-3PO, a protocol droid affiliated with the Rebellion who is fluent in over six million forms of communication. And it's it's such a great, like, he really shouldn't be in this situation. Like, he should be, like, arranging, like, like basically... If you if you had like a diplomatic kind of like like two diplomats meeting each other, he can translate between them, you know. Like they they probably each bring a protocol droid of their own, and the the diplomat would talk to the protocol droid, who would talk to the other protocol droid, who talk to the other diplomat. You know, that's what he's there for. He's he's a he's polite. He's like a butler, but. He's like on this situation where they're being chased by soldiers and like they're they're flying through space, all this stuff. It's it's yeah, it's it's very it's fun that he is in this ridiculous situation that he completely he should not be in this situation. He is one of the comic relief characters, and as such, some people will feel that he's annoying that the film goes too far to get laughs out of him. He's basically always, you know, personally, at least in this movie, I don't think he's, they, they go too far. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk about whether I feel that he is in some of the other movies when I do videos on the movies, but he's basically always polite, always trying to help, but most of the time, the things he thinks to do or say are not very welcome to the other characters and this is definitely in part because he complains a lot the first scene we see him in we he's freaking out over the boarding of the ship he's on while everyone else is trying to prepare to fight the stormtroopers and the second time we see him he's complaining about how he and R2D2 are always suffering it's our lot in life he says and yeah And Kenny Baker, RIP, as R2-D2, an astromech droid and C-3PO's companion who's carrying the Death Star plans and secret message for Obi-Wan from Princess Leia. And and yeah, you know, basically, like, he, he helps deal with spaceships 
like he can do some repairs and diagnostic work and such. So both of these robots were on the supposedly diplomatic vessel that we see at the very start of the film that is boarded by the, the em troops of the Empire. And, you know, on the, like, basically, C-3PO is there mostly to make it convincing that the, the like, if, if someone asks, you know, the, the, like, like, yeah, realize, hey, this is a diplomatic ship, don't you have an interpreter? He's right here. C-3PO, fluent in six million forms of communication. And R2-D2 can help diagnose problems with the ship and some repairs and such. But the fact that both of them end up on the run from soldiers, you know, like, basically both of them are out of their element for a lot of the movie. And, you know, R2-D2 is not very tall, but despite his size and the fact that he too has a bad job, he's much more feisty than C-3PO. He's very insistent that he has to help Leia, and the two of them bicker constantly, like an old married couple. And, again, it's... some people will find R2-D2 annoying, but I, I find him really, really funny. And, and charming. You just you you gotta respect how much how devoted he is to the mission. And Peter Mayhew, R.I.P., plays Chewbacca, a two hundred year old Wookiee Han Solo sidekick and first mate of the Millennium Falcon. He's seven foot three. He was seven foot three inch tall. You know, in two meters and twenty one centimeters tall, and yeah, like basically, George Lucas wanted someone who was really tall, and yeah. And Chewbacca has a sense of humor, but also a temper. And yeah, in addition to robots as major characters, this does in fact also feature aliens as major characters. Now, because it was easier to deal with other than R2-D2, they are very humanoid. But they don't really look like just human beings with a little bit of makeup. I get that early Star Trek did not have the budget to go beyond that, but I do really appreciate that this movie did go to, to the, yeah, and yeah, Chewbacca is introduced talking to Obi-Wan about flying Luke and Obi-Wan to Alderaan. And... David Prowse, R.I.P., as Darth Vader, and yeah, he serves the Galactic Empire, terrifying, sinister, evil. He's introduced walking in right after his stormtroopers have cleared the way, boarding the diplomatic ship that Leia's on at the start, and just his appearance and his walk, you can tell that this guy's in charge. like. These stormtroopers have just completely decimated the, the, you know, they've taken out, I'd say, at least a dozen of, of the regular soldiers, whilst themselves suffering almost no casualties at all. And they, you know, okay, so there's no one there, so they step aside, and then Vader walks in, and like, Vader walks, the, the way that he walks, you can tell that he has authority over them, so by extension, he is 
like he's an even worse enemy to have than the stormtroopers are and not long after he's picked up the captain of the ship and is holding him by the throat up in the air off the ground interrogating him and the 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 voice like he he has this deep booming voice that's really incredibly intense and intimidating and James Earl Jones does the voice of Darth Vader and originally like David Prowse himself did not get to do the the voice in part because of his West Country English accent which led to him be nicknamed within the cast as Darth Farmer and at first Lucas wanted Orson Welles to do Darth Vader's voice but he determined that Welles voice would be too familiar to audiences and he cast then relatively less recognizable Jones which today seems ridiculous because today everyone can recognize his voice but that's partly down to this movie and the work that he got because of this movie later Apparently, an early version featured a cast made entirely of robots. That would have been incredibly different. You really buy that Luke has a lot of, pardon the pun, faith in Obi-Wan Kenobi and that C-3PO and R2-D2 find each other endlessly annoying, that Han Solo doesn't believe in the Force at all and thinks people who do are ridiculous that Leia and Han Solo can't stand each other, you know, the, they're very convincing in these, yeah. It's remarkable how much Kenny Baker can communicate when there really is not a lot in the way of range of movement for R2-D2. And C-3PO has these very stiff movements that in-universe are because he's a robot without a lot of flexibility. You know, he's, he's a protocol droid. He's, he's supposed to translate. He's not, you know, he's not going around, like, I don't know, building cars the way that there are robots today that can build cars. Obviously, they need a certain level of flexibility, but, yeah. Chewbacca does not speak a single word of English, but they all manage to communicate a lot through other means, and... There's a lot of alien languages in this and other Star Wars movies. Sometimes you'll have characters responding to in English to get a sense of what was said. Occasionally there are subtitles. And a few are real languages, just ones that, you know, a lot of the, the moviegoers don't speak. Like, let's see. The Jawa's language is Zulu, electronically sped up, and Greedo's language, I'm going to... Go ahead and guess that it's pronounced Kekwa, an indigenous South American language. But a lot of the time, we simply have languages spoken that the audience will not understand the way that, you know, right now I'm speaking English because so much of the, the world speaks English, so you understand what I'm saying because you understand the specific words I'm saying. But, yeah, a lot of the alien language stuff spoken in this film, you really don't know, like, what, what individual words are being said, and, yeah. And that brings us to the dialogue. George Lucas' dialogue writing, at least within this franchise, I honestly don't remember in American Graffiti, it's just not very natural. Harrison Ford is said to have said, you can type this crap, but you can't say it. And Carrie Fisher has described being trapped in the gobbledygook of George's typewriter. But basically, you know, they and Mark Hamill stood up to Lucas 
and he allowed the actors and actresses to basically improvise their own wording for the basic points of the screenplay's dialogue and it really worked out like they the the lines that they speak in this movie do legitimately like you have stuff in there that is like you know stuff that we the viewer don't really have the context to understand directly but it's important for world building and setup and such but the the characters do also otherwise speak or yeah other all all oh, overall the characters do speak in a in a fairly natural way he, the the way that comes naturally to just yeah and it's the 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 line delivery is much smoother than you would think for all the concepts in dialogue like if you you know like the first time you watch this you, actually yeah no not really today because we know so much from cultural osmosis but the first time people watched this in 77 a lot of it m must have been very difficult to really follow and understand because so much is said that just isn't it isn't defined and it isn't explained now there's not really any dialogue that's just white noise it conveys characterization and exposition well some of it is quotable and memorable. I don't think the bad guys have a single line that isn't incredibly quotable. And there are some lines by the... Yeah, there, there are a number of lines by the good guys. Like many of the things in the movie that are very different from our own world, the dialogue is something where the movie really just expect you to do your best to keep up. It's not going to define the various terms. It's not going to explain everything about backstory or concepts. To some people that makes it exhausting, but to the rest of us it's incredibly stimulating to have this full immersion experience. Especially because when this first came out you couldn't just go somewhere, like hypothetically let's say that you watched a Actually, yeah, George Lucas specifically did say that it was somewhat like when he watched Japanese movies because they didn't explain their concepts to a Westerner because they weren't made specifically for English-speaking audiences who didn't already know Japanese culture. And, yeah, it's it's kind of like if, you know, if, if you're really into anime, for example, the like early on you have to look up a bunch of stuff and try to figure out well, what does that mean in Japanese culture you know what what is okay I guess technically not all anime is Japanese I'm, I'm not really an expert but you know you can look up okay so what does this mean in their in their culture and you can't do that with with this I couldn't at the time I guess today they're probably at least some of it you can like look up and it'll say but it's just it's it's such a it's it's such a cool idea to just say here is this movie that is just it's not really for us you know like it's it, like I said it's it's like they intercepted it from another world and now we get to watch it but we have to figure out what's going on ourselves you know and some of the characterization, like some of the characters, we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. Like Leia, Luke, Han, Obi-Wan, and Darth Vader, we all get a sense of what are they like. You know, what, what, what does it look like when things are going their way? What does it look like? when they get frustrated or you know, 
do they get frustrated or do they see it as, as an opportunity? And I would say long after watching the movie, something that really stays with you is just the sense of all these other cultures of this world that's so different from our own and how like the the yeah the the confidence with which the movie presents all these concepts that we don't have the context to fully understand and it's it the movie really feels like it's just not afraid that audiences are going to be confused and frustrated and sometimes confidence can go a long way I think the movie would have been more frustrating for sure there are some people who did find it frustrating but it would have come across as more frustrating if it wasn't as confident about it because that kind of confidence kind of like you get the sense okay I guess there's there's something to it because they wouldn't be this confident if there wasn't if there was just nothing to it at all so yeah now the cinematography was handled by Gilbert Taylor RIP and other stuff I've seen him be the director of photography for include Frenzy, Repulsion, Hard Day's Night, and Dr. Strangelove. And at least a few key scenes were filmed emulating the cinematography of Leni Riefenstahl and her propaganda film Triumph of the Will and footage of, like World War II. I, I forget if it was stuff from movie fictional movies made about World War II or if it actually was like war footage that but yeah and it, it worked incredibly well you know it's it's that thing of like the the I, f I forget the exact quote but it's something along the lines of the best creative minds are the ones who know who to steal from And the editing, let's see, yeah, so there are multiple editors, so Richard Chu, T.M. Christopher, Paul Hirsch, Marsha Lucas, Lucas's wife at least back then, John Jimson, R.I.P., and Lucas himself, and Thankfully, before this was released, the movie was recut because the way that it was originally arranged was nowhere near as good as it ended up. Some scenes were cut entirely, such as the first several scenes that Luke even appears in because they simply were not relevant. They were bogging down the film. Other scenes were moved around, which increased the tension, making the audience focus more on the stakes and the villains. Like, as it is... The Luke is introduced, I think, 17 and a half minutes in, and he is technically the protagonist. So, you know, at, at first, the first time you watch it, you might think that Leia is the protagonist, because at the very, very start of the movie, she's kind of presented as that, but for a chunk of the movie, she's captured. So, you know, she's in, in a cell. And, yeah, it's. You can understand why they thought that, well, you can't. You can't wait until 17 and a half minutes in to introduce the main character. You have to introduce, but once they remove those scenes, like, I, I haven't watched, I think, what's it called, the assembly cut or rough cut or something like that, so I can't say for sure, but I have seen clips from it, and I've seen some people explain about the order and such, and just, yeah, it sounds like it was a real slog. And again, it's, it's one of these things of, like, Lucas himself was passionate about Luke, so he wanted to see Luke from really early on. But when they got to editing, it was like, well, he's, he's not that interesting before he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi. So the first several scenes, like, le legit, they cut them. They're not in the movie. 
and people watch the movie and they're not confused, you know, we're not confused while watching the movie, which does tell you that the scenes ultimately didn't need to be there. And this is the kind of movie where if it's not really effective and or it doesn't need to be there, then you maybe should remove it. Now, when the when Stanley Kubrick made the masterpiece 2001 A Space Odyssey, he wanted everything to look sleek and clean, brand new, state of the art. And that works incredibly well for that movie. But when George Lucas made this, he went for a lived-in feel. Everything that we see in the movie feels like it actually exists. Because it is dirty, it is worn. Where a number of sci-fi movies are in love with what the technology can do, this is a movie where the characters are used to a lot of the technology that we the viewer think is amazing. Luke talks about working on one of the sci-fi inventions in this movie the way young people in real life when this was made would talk about fixing up their motorcycle. It would have been a terrible idea for this movie to emulate 2001 Space Odyssey in this respect and certain others. Because that that is the thing like you know in like the 60s when people thought oh you know one day we'll have like a device in our hands that we can like say something into and it'll do the thing that we tell it to or or maybe maybe we can say something in one language and it'll tell us what that thing is in another language and it can like find information that we just have to like write what we want or or say what we want and that's going to be amazing you know in the 60s they thought oh my it's going it's going to blow everybody's minds it's going to be it's going to change life as we know it and today we have all those things and to a lot of us it is like well you know i've had this thing for a while i know what it can do like it's not that we're never excited about the technology but we're not acting the way with it that people in the 60s thought that would that, that would be the case you know you know when when the when Luke and Obi-Wan talk to to Han Solo he brags about how good of a pilot he is and Luke is like and and then he says what his price is and Luke is like we can just buy our own ship for that price I, I could probably pilot it. You know what? Goodbye. I don't, you know, and, and Obi-Wan's like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Well, I, I, I think I have a way to resolve this. But, you know, Luke isn't like, wow, you have a spaceship. You can travel from planet to planet. He's just like, you want us to pay you what? Come on, this is ridiculous. You know, which is not, like, hypothetically, if someone, yeah, if, if, a, if a spaceship landed on Earth, and then out walked some aliens, and they were like, if you pay us a million dollars, we'll take you back to our planet. We wouldn't be like, a million? Ah, I don't know. I, it's, it's. We'd be like, holy crap, yeah, you know. But once that's happened a million times, you know, after a while, you kind of get used to it. Now, the animation is quite impressive, like, there is, let's see, I'm pretty sure at least a little bit of it is claymation and s maybe also other stop motion and, like, uh, yeah, I guess the, those are the ones, but yeah, they, they do a really great job with it. Right, some 2D for like displays and such. And the, the special effects with a lot of, of model shots and, you know, green screen and such, matte paint. And they, they did an incredible job. It's, it's wild how many effects there are. You know, again, like, if you compare it to movies made today, you know, today you have movies that co cost between 100 and 200 million to make that have even more effects than this. But when this was made, like, nobody, it just wasn't, 
special effects just weren't considered to be convincing enough and like price ah what's the word like they were they were deemed too expensive to have all that many in just one movie you know I, I saw several reviewers point out that before this movie came out like it was, there was this Dino De Laurentiis King Kong movie that won the Oscar for special effects even though apparently the effects of it really aren't that impressive but there's just there was not a lot of competition back then you know and yeah it's it's incredible what they they did here again today if you you know if you if you somehow manage to find a copy that pre precedes the special edition yeah, you can really see the scenes, but yeah. I've only ever seen the cleaned up versions from after 1997 when they released the special editions. I know someone who has watched versions from before then. He said that if you look carefully, you could tell. In, uh, yeah, before. The versions before the special edition. Now. I don't know if they've released a version where they got rid of all the new stuff they added for the special editions because a lot of that was unnecessary the CGI was not photorealistic and I suppose let's see. yeah in 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 episode 6 the return of the Jedi the, the changes may remind us of characters in the prequel trilogy that we really don't like to think about. And for some, it's the depiction now. Spoiler for the prequels. Anakin Skywalker. No more spoilers for the prequels. And for some, it's the fact that the character exists at all, such as Jar Jar Binks. And the stunt work is great. The budget was eleven million dollars and the box office was seven hundred and seventy five point eight million dollars. So yeah, it was a bit of a success. And the the filming includes Tunisia. Guatemala. Yeah, for in Tunisia, they filmed Tatooine, a desert planet. Guatemala, they filmed the fourth moon of Yavin. And let's see. Let's see. But yeah, the the The, yeah, there's this vast, expansive desert. There's a rocky cavern. And costume-wise, a lot of the characters wear things that look nothing like what we wear in real life. And they, they strike this great balance between something... Like, it looks like... It's something that these people would wear. They didn't just pick something weird, a random, but it also. Ah, what's the word? It, but yeah, but it doesn't look like something that we are familiar with. And yeah, the action is great. And this is the kind of movie where the heroes are great shots frequently managing to take out their targets, but somehow the bad guys are bad shots. I have trouble hitting, their, hitting the good guys, and I think it works well for the movie. Now, among the action scene types, you know, the... the yeah, it's not really as well. There, there's a, a lightsaber duel. There's shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. There's chasing, both chasing in vehicles and chasing on foot. 
it's not really a horror movie, but there are a few scenes that are really terrifying. Like there's some some of the creatures and and such are really like ah, what's the word? Horrifying. That's the more good. Now I don't think I'm going to give away what the relationship is with between yeah, I just briefly want to say the the both Grand Moff Tarkin and Darth Vader are very memorable villains, and like let's see, I suppose I guess it's not charismatic necessarily, but like they are like they make a strong impression. Like you could understand why people would be afraid to stand up to these guys. And, yeah, I, I'm not going to give away exactly what their relationships with the protagonist is, but it is compelling. The villain plan makes sense, and that was the right choice. The hero's plan makes sense, and that was also the right choice. The scenes are easy to follow, and they're meant to. And I think that was the right call. Visually, the movie is easy enough to follow, even though you see stuff that you're not used to seeing. I think this was the right choice. I don't think the movie would have been as popular if there had been things that were very difficult to follow visually. But, like, there's just enough that you can really latch on to, like... Let's see, what would be an example? Like, I've seen some... There are some science fiction stories where they come up with ways for the good guys to fight the bad guys that are completely different from what we do in real life. And for some of them it works, especially if that's one of the only science fiction moments. Or if it's like a book where you can explain it properly. But here, like, you know, the good guys and bad guys, they fire, you know, yeah, they're like, they they're not called laser guns but blasters they've but they do file fire projectile weapons at each other you know that they hold in their hands they and and you know the the yeah so so things like that you can like if if the movie is is either like overwhelming you with just there's too much you can't take it all in or you're bored because they're talking about something they don't completely understand. You know, if when enough time has passed, someone will start shooting at someone else. You know. Now the music was handled by John Williams, and yeah, I'm just briefly gonna talk about some other movies that he also did the music for. Yeah, I don't have to mention the other Star Wars movies they, but. Munich, Catch Me If You Can, Minority Report, Stepmom, Saving Private Ryan, Amistad, Saving Years in Tibet, Nixon, Shin vs. List, Jurassic Park, Home Alone, 1 and 2, Far and Away, JFK, Born on the Fourth of July, The Witches of Eastwick, E.T. 1941, Superman, Family Plot, and Jaws. And because so much of the movie has so many things that are so different from our day-to-day -day lives, the music has to do a lot of heavy lifting, informing us what the different scenes are supposed to convey emotionally, and it is 100% up to that task. There's a liberal use of a leitmotif for the score, and it, it works incredibly well. The music is rousing, and it does effectively convey if a scene is, yeah, I, I, th I think the term they used was emotional anchor. And, yeah, the sound design by Ben Burt. A lot of the props, effects, makeup and such 
are supported by the sound design, which really helps sell that this is incredibly different from what we're used to, and just the, it's, it's wild, like, you would, if Star Wars didn't exist and someone tried to explain this stuff to you, you wouldn't think that it would ever work. Like, the, the stuff in the movie tends to not sound the way stuff does in real life. Like, they took real life sounds and used them for stuff that's completely different from, from yeah. Well, you know, there, there are some things that, like, Chewbacca is this, like, in, you know, in some ways, he's almost like a bipedal dog, and he has these roars, and Ben Burt recorded zoo-kept grizzly bears. You know, that's not a huge surprise. But then, like, R2-D2 sounds like he would... Ben Burt took recordings of real-life babies or made baby-like sounds himself with his mouth and electronically manipulated them and it works like you you know he does it does give R2D to a sort of innocent quality he taught he it's it has a baby talk quality but it's not what's the word and and for sure like when R2, when C3PO moves his joints make a, a typical robot noise. But a lot of the time, the, the various, like the technologies, the alien languages, all this stuff, they sound a way that you don't expect on, if, if you're not familiar with Star Wars already. You know, they really, they have this really unique quality to them, and like, if you, if you didn't know, like, if someone tried to explain it to me and I didn't already know that it works, yeah, I would probably be like, there's no way that's going to work. There's no way. It can't possibly work. And again, this was, this was made at a time when science fiction, like, you pretty much knew what to expect from what it sounds. To be fair, some Star Trek or also did, you know, also had unusual sounds, but... A lot of science fiction before Star Wars, it had, like, you, okay, there's going to be some aliens, there's going to be some robots, and they're going to sound this and that way, because that's the way aliens and robots sound in science fiction movies, because a lot of people are afraid to take great risks, creative risks, and sometimes that's a good thing, because some, you know, there are some movies that just they're they're too different and it just it doesn't work but sometimes it's really good if someone can take a calculated risk and it worked out incredibly well here now the comedy you know there's some bickering complaining whining there's a little bit of slapstick you know a lot of the humor is kind of silly and goofy stuff and I know people who really wish that either it wasn't there at all or at least it was significantly trimmed or toned down but I mean I can't really I can't be objective to it I think it's funny you know I I think the the robots are funny Chewbacca is funny you know Han Solo's you know but like he's he's He really doesn't believe in the the rebellion. He uh, rebel rebellion rebel alliance. He doesn't have any stake in that at all. He just wants to be paid because he just took a huge risk for these people that he doesn't know, and they're like, don't ask questions. And you know, he did the job, and now he just wants the money, and just yeah, I I find it funny. Not everyone will. And tonally, like, in some ways, this has aspects of a Saturday morning cartoon or a comic book. And that is something that bothers some viewers and critics. Personally, I love that about it.
I think the movie does a really good job of establishing from right away that this is this world is the, the world of Star Wars is incredibly different from our world and as such like the the ah, what's the saying you know you're not sitting watching the movie frustrated at seeing them be able to do things in this movie that we can't do in real life personally I try not to think of things like that but some people have a difficult time not thinking like that and the movie tells you right off the bat this is not our world. The pacing is quite good. The, the threat posed by the Galactic Empire to the major characters is ever-present. They're never very long without them making significant progress in catching up to them. I haven't really detailed the following so I'll just briefly like basically Instead of me continuing to call it diplomatic vessel, I'm almost certain it's tan the Tansive V, the the ship, the diplomatic vessel. At the start of the movie, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Leia are on it, but then it gets boarded by stormtroopers and Darth Vader. Leia has the the Death Star plans, and she puts them into R2-D2, who once again can be used to, you know, he can he can help take apart something to to fix it again. So, yeah, you can you can put information into him, and she records a uh, a message that can play as a hologram, where she pleads her case to Obi-Wan Kenobi. After doing this, she sends R2-D2 to the planet Tatooine, the, the planet closest to it, and that's where it, uh, yeah, Leia was headed to Tatooine uh, anyway. And at first, C-3PO doesn't want to go with, but he, yeah, he ultimately does follow R2 into this escape pod, and they go to the Tatooine. And the, the, yeah. After that, the you know it doesn't take long for the the empire, the various people working for the empire, to realize the the Death Star plans must be on a droid that must be on Tatooine. So they send a bunch of troopers down to Tatooine. They start going door to door, demanding to see droids, and just yeah I can't really say too much more without spoiling but they they are constantly making progress in in trying to get to the 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 Death Star plans and I suppose yeah I'll, I'll just say that the the Death Star plans ending up in the right hands is extremely important now, the movie is two hours long without end credits, and two hours and five minutes long with them. It is well worth the investment of time. If you're not interested, maybe 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. And I, I should say, I really don't blame anyone who, like, if you start watching it today, and you just find that it just, it doesn't move, you know, it, it doesn't move at the same pace that movies do today. And if that's frustrating to you, I could definitely understand. Yeah. I mean, part of... I've, there are movies that are significantly longer and slower than this movie that I love, that I had watched by the time I first watched this. So I was kind of already... Like, my father has always loved movies, and a number of the movies from his youth he introduced to me when I was a child, so, and, and teenager, so I already was accustomed to that kind of thing, but, yeah, if, if you're not, then it will be, yeah, it might strain you. And, I would say the best element of the movie is the world building and the sense of adventure. And yeah, 
the worst aspect is that it can be difficult to find a version that doesn't have the 1997 special edition changes. Some of those can definitely be frustrating. If you want a video that discusses the special edition versus the original, watch H Bomber Guys weighing the value of director's cuts scan line. And yeah, you know, basically like try to go into the movie knowing that lowering your expectations And, yeah, you know, a worst aspect according to others, a number of people say it's too old and boring. If it's, you know, the, the first time you watch it, you maybe don't watch that many movies from the 70s, that's going to bother you. I don't think it's boring at all. I, You know, if, if you think it might be boring for you, but you have at least one friend that loves the movie, maybe try to arrange watching it with them. I've There are movies that I ultimately didn't really like, but I watched them with someone who was passionate about them, and because of that, I enjoyed them. And Before the first time I watched the movie, I was most worried that it wouldn't live up to the hype, but it, you know, and again, the first time it didn't, but when I went back to it, I found that it exceeded the hype. I was most looking forward to the action scenes and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, the, the movie is entertaining. It is good as a whole. It does leave some unanswered questions, which, you know, it's, it's fine. It's not a big problem. There are answers to some of the mysteries, which is good, and now, yeah, the trailers, you see some stuff from late in the film in the trailers, but some of them are things you knew would happen, and other are things that, if you haven't watched the movie, you don't know that they happen near the end, so, yeah, you don't really have to avoid the, the trailers. Now, let's see, there are several trailers, let's see, one that's 2 minute 45 seconds, a modern one that's 2 minute and 6 seconds, 1 minute and 7 seconds, yeah, there, there, are, there are various, and they're, you know, like the film, they're, other than the modern one, they're edited back when this came out, and they, you know, they don't look like current trailers, and they were advertising to a very different audience than today. But yeah, the they do a good job representing the movie, giving if if you like the trailers, you you're likely to like the movie as well. Some of the cover and posters do give away too much, and. Some of them do give you a good idea of what the movie is like. I think it's worth appreciating how ridiculously different some of the posters are from the final product. Like, they're as epic as the movie itself, but a number of them look nothing like the movie. Like, the ones where Luke has an open shirt and Leia's got this cape and her legs are bare other than this kind of skirt thing. It just... It's, it's amazing. It looks nothing like the movie. But it, it, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like the, the people who made those, like, they knew what the movie was like, but they were worried that they couldn't sell it based on that. So they were like, you know what, I'll just, I'll draw something epic. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a real epic, cool looking, something that's going to put butts in seats. And then afterwards they can be like, well, that was nothing like the poster at all, but you know what? Fair enough, because they were both epic. The movie does not have a lot of metaphors or difficult to understand elements, though if you go into the movie expecting the world of it to be explained, either you adjust and accept that it won't be, or that's going to frustrate you. There's not as much depth as 
you know, in, in I do want to say it definitely has some clear values that it wants to communicate, but in some aspects it is fairly black and white without a lot of shades of gray or like real <sighs> complexity. Later movies would add shades of gray depth and complexity. Back when this was made, there really wasn't an expectation for a movie to deliver both blockbuster excitement and depth the way that some movies today do manage to deliver both. And yeah, I, I don't think that it's a bad thing. They have managed to get actual depth and shades of gray and complexity into this franchise in some of the other movies. Now, and, and it is like, this is a movie that you could show, okay, maybe not a seven-year-old, there's maybe a little bit of stuff in there that's a little too intense. Nine or ten. You, yeah, you could show this movie to a ten-year-old, and they'll follow the conflict, and they'll get into it, they'll want to see the bad guys stop, they'll want to see the good guys Bad guys stop, good guys win, and when you have movies that have more complexity, some of those you can't really show to a child because they'll just walk away confused and they'll be like, some of it was fine, but I didn't really, it was, you know, I didn't know who the good guys and the bad guys were. And I think sometimes today we don't place enough value, we, we don't value enough stories that are simple, stories that you could tell a child and it'll, it'll explain to them the value of certain things and you can't really, yeah, you know, The Dark Knight is definitely a much more complex movie than this and you know moves faster and and such and such but if you try showing that to a 10 year old like they wouldn't really be able to I, th I think you'd have to be at least 13 probably older to fully understand the complexities there or you'll just walk away and not be completely sure like not 100 percent certain if, if the ending was a victory or a defeat, and like, did the good guys... Yeah, I suppose I can't really... Yeah, I, I think you know what I'm getting at. This is a movie that you can show to a child, and that child will understand. If people show up in uniforms, and they're talking about how bad it is when the people can communicate that they're that that they think something is dangerous they feel threatened or something if if you meet someone who says that's a bad thing that person is a fascist and yeah the the Anyway, I'll, I'll talk more about the, the fascist traits the, of, of the empire in the, let's see, in the section entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. This video is getting a lot longer than I, I thought I was, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not, like, take forever, but there's just, I have so much to say about it, even without, anyway. That brings us. So, the. Yeah, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has 92% from critics, 96% from users, and let's see, the critics. Uh, yeah, 132 critic reviews, over 250,000 ratings from users. On Metacritic, it has 90 out of 100. The user score 8.8 .8 out of 10. 
and let's see, 24 Metacritic ratings, 344 user reviews. At least when I checked, thinking about that was days ago, so could be more. On IMDb, it has an 8.6 out of 10. There are 1,972 IMDb user reviews and 200 on the IMDb's external reviews section. Now, the violence is mostly mild and bloodless. There is a little that doesn't fit that description. Yes, some, some bloody violence, gore, and disturbing material. And... I recommend reading the reviews written by Roger Ebert, RIP, and Marianne Johansson. And, yeah, ultimately, the movie... I want to take this opportunity to praise the excellent Star Wars impressions of Brian Hull and Brizzy Voices and the incredibly hilarious bad lip reading videos of the Star Wars movies. I would say not to watch the, you know, they, if you haven't already watched the Star Wars movies, be careful not to watch a bad lip reading video of one of the movies you haven't already watched, but they are clearly separated into one video per movie that they did, including the entire original trilogy. I love how the characterizations in the Battle of Readings videos are completely different from the actual film. Some would say that comedy is taking something familiar and changing the context, and that happens a lot in the Battle of Readings videos for Star Wars and a lot of their other videos as well. Normally, I read everything on IMDb except for, like, I don't always read all the user reviews and external reviews if there are a lot, but there were so many for this film that I didn't get around to, you know, I spent the last week or so reading a bunch of stuff for it, but just for trivia, there's 466 trivia entries. So, yeah. I recommend this movie to fans of sci-fi action epics. And... If you're a fan of Star Wars, you know, it has the entire franchise, all, all the films, and the... Is it both? The, oh, no, wait, never mind. There are multiple shows, it's just that not all of them are in continuity. I If, if there is a Star Wars show that isn't on Disney+, Plus, then I don't know about it. It's possible that that is the case. And... On Disney Plus, it has a lot of extras. Like, I I didn't count exactly. I went by the the way it's written, how much time it's written to take on the. Yeah, when you when you look on the on the page, but upwards of 175 minutes or two hours and 55 minutes. And. So, you know, similar to how most MCU movies have good stuff and some of them have a lot. And, yeah, I rate this 10 elegant weapons for most civilized age out of 10. And that brings us, let's see, now that I've moved the camera, i got to figure out think if I do this. There it is. So, spoilers throughout the rest of the video. We are now in the thoughts sections. So. Thoughts section start. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I might like keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, once I get into the rest of it itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So yeah, through, from for the rest of the video, 
I will no longer be warning about spoilers for this movie. I will warn if I spoil anything other than this movie. I don't have a problem with violence in court general. I think it's one of my favorite horror movies and books in general. I also love film books to fly, video film, etc. I don't have a problem with film. Let's see. Yeah, disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here that I loved every line they put in the end of the quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. The rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of well thoughts. Some is analysis, some is unsaturated with tracks and other jokes. And it's time for the sections on the description box. The section right after this one is the time while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I have before watching. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the most likable characters? No, ultimately, we don't really know why, like, let's see. Really, any of the villains... The, the, yeah, the villains don't have a lot of... We, we don't really know, like... I think it's Tarkin who says that the fear of the Death Star will keep people in line. But he doesn't really say that he's worried that if that isn't the case, they're gonna, like, find out where his family lives and threaten them or something. He just wants his enemies to be afraid of him and like really the only th thing yeah and and anyway what I'm getting at is I think that was the right choice the, this is one of those areas where the movie is not is where the movie is fairly black and white you know we're, we're told that I suppose I won't Yeah, Luke Skywalker's father was killed by Darth Vader, who was seduced by the dark side of the Force, even though, you know, and, and he and Obi-Wan had, you know, originally Obi-Wan was training him, and yeah, that's, there's not a lot of depth there, that's just detail. You know, that just, like, of course we want him to be defeated when what we know about him is that he killed the protagonist's father, which clearly caused him a lot of pain. He betrayed, yeah, betrayed the, the protagonist's father, and, you know, he used to be one of the good guys, but he just couldn't, he couldn't resist. He, he wanted more power. He wanted... Yeah, so so it it works really well. It is this thing of like um a myth or a legend kind of the the and it is this thing of like essentially if this if this movie is one of the only things that you as a child you know, hopefully this is not the only but hypothetically, or maybe it's just the first, and maybe, you know, it's important and it makes a strong impression. Like, hopefully, when you watch this, it tells you if there are fascists out there, even if they're powerful, it's important to fight back. It's important to, to help the people that they're threatening, and ultimately, you can defeat fascists, and yeah, the, the movie does a really good job of that, and I've seen movies that more, like, try to understand fascism, and some of them are incredible, but very few of them work well if you're just trying to convey to a child that has a fairly limited understanding of the world, they can't understand complex concepts, that the individual people who support fascism may have some good reasons for it even though you know obviously fascism is never okay but there are like if you think that being a fascist prevents something 
worse than fascism. I could understand it. It's still not okay, but I could understand it. But the moment that you say that, they're going to be like, well, now I don't want to fight fascists. They could, you know, what if they, what if they don't really want to be fascists? Well, as long as they have guns, we have to fight them. You know, fascism has to be fought wherever we find it. And and part of that is, you know, one, once in in situations where there's not a very real imminent physical threat threat to people's lives and livelihoods then we have the luxury of trying to have a conversation with them and trying to explain to them that fascism is bad but if you're being threatened you have to defend yourself now i really appreciate that leia is not you know, I'm, I'm just briefly going to read out the, you know, the way that women are sometimes treated in genre movies. Disposable, mis with misogynist tropes. Useless, not strong, sexualized against their will, and or only there for that purpose. Sexually assaulted or rape, without the film exploring the effects of it, etc. And, yeah, like the... You know, obviously, the I, I do think an argument could be made that the torture... I, I appreciate that it was completely off-screen. And ultimately, like, it's implied that more than... Like, primarily, it's, I'm, it's essentially like a truth serum or something. Like, or I guess that depends on how, how dark you want to take it. Maybe it's just a truth serum. But anyway, the the... An argument could be made that that should be removed from the film, but yeah, you know, like yeah, she gets captured, but how how could she possibly have gotten away, you know? And the, you know, like if she tried to get to an escape pod, they would have stopped that escape pod, you know. They specifically the reason they don't do anything about the one that R two D two and C three P O are in is because it's scanned and there are no life forms inside so the the you know the moment that she's out of the the cell she's immediately working on trying to get them out of there she's not like just passively waiting for them to and actually she's the one who gets them into the garbage chute and yeah you know in the in the short term Han complains about that, but in the long term, they do get out of there. The, I, I don't think they would have been able to get out of there if she hadn't making that very decisive action there. And she, you know, she's not afraid to speak her mind. She, you know, when when Han says that he's only in it for the money, she she specifically says, if money is all you love, then that's what you'll get. You know, you clearly implying that his life won't be as fulfilling if all he cares about is money which again that like a seven-year-old could watch this movie and pick that up the princess points out that if you only care about money you'll you know your life will be empty and by the end of the movie Han has grown he, he does risk his own skin for other people and for the sake of the rebellion so that shows that you know even if you want to be cool like Han he still eventually turned around and you know and I suppose yeah I think that but I, I really appreciate that the movie does yeah I wish there were more female characters in the movie and but yeah ultimately right and the movie is in a genre where it is important not to overexpose the threat of the creature for example does this movie do a good job of that how does it do balance suspense it's wild to think about that Darth Vader is in very little of this movie actually and I mean he 
he isn't technically the central villain. Tarkin is. But, yeah, it's, it's... Vader never stopped being this intimidating presence. Now, my making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, or me wanting to make light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to mystify gate everything I watch. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. So yeah, the the battle that takes place right after the the stone what is that saying? Yeah, the the ah, what do they call it nowadays? The Star Destroyer reaches the ship that Leia is on, or the Tantive V if you're nasty is really excellent. They do such a good job of showing the stormtroopers overpowering the rebels. From this one battle we can understand why the evil Galactic Empire is so powerful. Like, they've done this like hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And yeah, like, they win. They, they wipe the floor with their enemies. I like that when we first see the Jawas, they come across as kind of creepy. They knock out R2-D2, who, who we have sympathy for, but then when we see them with Unglo and Luke a little later, we see that they're just running a business. They, they find robots, knock them out, and resell them. They literally treat R2-D2 as property when we know that he has personality, he has ideas of his own. This is clearly not what he wants. The characters just don't care about what robots want. Which, at, at this moment, I feel I should plug the Pop Culture Detective Agency. Or is it just called Pop Culture Detective? Some, something like that. Who made an excellent video. Ah, uh, let me think. Was it maybe called The Problem of Droids? In Star Wars? Some, something like that. But yeah. He, uh, he talks about all the all the issues, the, the human rights issues brought up in these movies. Do, do note that it spoils every thing Star Wars, right up, un up until and including The Mandalorian. As whiny as C-3PO is, he is good at selling himself to Owen. He makes himself kind of, you know, sound like something that Owen needs. You know, originally he was supposed to have, like, the personality of a car, used car salesman. Maybe that bit was, like, left over from back, from that draft. Uncle Owen, this R5 unit has a bad motivator. It's definitely not as motivated as R2-D2 is at following you. And Luke says, you know, I think the R2 unit we bought may have been stolen. In other words, the Jawas keep to themselves that they're still droids. Or maybe it's just that Luke is naive. I think the, the movie does a really good job of, like, Luke really does not want to be a farmer. He, he wants something else for his life. And... You know, he, he thought that his father was just, what was it, a miner, a spa space, spice freighter, some, something like that. And Obi-Wan tells him, no, he was a Jedi Knight, and he was killed. You know, I worked with him, and he was killed by Darth Vader. So at that point, we badly want, like, even if Obi-Wan hadn't said, here, this is your father's lightsaber, he wanted you to have it as soon as you were old enough. Even if he hadn't said that, we'd be thinking he has to follow in his father's footsteps. He has to become a Jedi Knight and save the galaxy. 
you know, it's it's a it's a very straightforward. We've we've seen this kind of story in a lot of different places, but again, it is like if you know the. I was about to say there aren't, but technically there are, but they're just not very effective. There are people who identify as Jedi in in real life and worship uh worship worship the force. That uh yeah, anyway. They can actually use the force the way and, and lightsabers and such the way that the Jedi in the movie can. So it's not that, oh, I hope a lot of people watch the, this movie and then go out and become Jedi. No, but you, you identify how can you help, how can you make the world a better place, and then you go for that, and you can get there, you know, by, the, like, at the start of the movie, Luke is a farm boy. At the end of the movie, he saved the galaxy you know it's 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 incredible how much and and you know the first time when when obi-wan puts the helmet on him he's like i can't see a thing it's, how how am i supposed to be able to stop the the blast yeah the blasts from the the little droid but he listens to obi-wan and he does manage to and then yeah you know, that it, it is the kind of thing where it it there are a lot of great movies that explain that people who ended up doing evil things, many of them they started out with good intentions, but if you tell that to a seven year old, they're not going to pursue their dreams. If you tell a seven year old, Luke started out as a farm boy and like I mean, what is it in in universe, is it a day later, maybe that he blow up blows up the deaths. A anyway, you know the the um, actually come to think of it, if you're flying between planets, and one of the planets has two suns, then I'm not sure we can like is a day still 24 hours? And, and anyway, but it hasn't it not very long passes between, and he he saves the world. Everyone cheers. He gets a medal. So. Yeah, I, I think a lot of young people have been inspired by watching this when they were young and thinking, I want to fight for what I want to be. When we first watched the movie, we empathized with Luke wanting to know more about his father and wanting adventure, but on rewatch, we really do understand why Owen is worried, especially if you... What, you know, as you watch the other Star Wars movies. It was very clever of R2-D2, or, yeah, of R2 only to play the last part of the message to Luke, so that he knows to find Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know, that that's important. It, or, yeah, find Obi-Wan Kenobi, that's important to Leia, and he's compelled by his empathy for Leia, R2 doesn't know if Luke can be trusted when he just plays the end of the message, so, yeah. This bickering is pointless. It's like we're just sitting here delivering exposition as if we're in a piece of fiction. Obi-Wan says that only stormtroopers could have been this precise. This line gets a lot of criticism and understandable, so I suppose what he should have said is, only stormtroopers could have been this precise as long as they're not shooting at people with plot armor. At first it's just pretty cool then Luke can predict where the laser blast is going to shoot so that he can stop the blast with the lightsaber. But then at the end of the movie he makes the million and one shot destroying the Death Star without being able to see, without using the targeting, you know, it works even the first time you watch it, but you don't see it coming. They do a great job of building up how epic the Death Star is. It can destroy a planet. You, you know, Han Solo points out a thousand Star Destroyers firing their most powerful weapons couldn't destroy an entire planet. And you know, he sees, he sees it, and he says, "No, nah, it's 
it's too big to be a space station, you know. They they do, yeah, really great job. I've seen some say that if the compartment under the floorboards can be used for smuggling, then why did Han have to dump the cargo? The way I see it, the cargo was simply too big for it all to be in the compartments, so he had to dump it. They do a good job of setting up Han as someone that doesn't risk his life, so when he does risk his life and ship there at the end, it shows that he's really grown. There's already a good sense of threat in the movie before the good guys make it to the Death Star, but once they're on the Death Star, it is a substantial increase in danger. I really, I, th I think they do a really great job of bringing together, like, okay, so Han and Luke run off to save the princess, and then she, and, and yeah, and, and then Han, Luke, and the princess run around trying to get back to the ship. C-3PO and R2-D2, they are in that room with the, like, communication where they shot their way in, and so they have to get to and yeah, they have to get back to the ship. And Obi Wan first he goes off to to turn off the cl uh, not cloaking device tractor beam, and then he meets up with with Darth Vader, and they're very close to the the what's it called? Ah, they're very close to the hangar bay. No matter the circumstance, Leia always tries to save the day and has good suggestions for what the others can do as well. Like, when they end up in the in the trash compactor, like, Han is like, oh, great idea. And she's like, shut up, find something. Let's see, what was the first thing? I've, I, right now, I've, I forget what the, was it a way to get out of there or something like that, you know, and... He he shoots at the at the wall, and she's like, "Do you really think we hadn't tried that already?" And you know, once the the trash compactor starts crushing them, she's you know she gets like a a thing to to block the walls, but of course it starts getting, you know, it it slows it down maybe a little, but not yeah. And it is such a a clever like the trash compactor. You know, there's like, there's this, there's at least one big creature down there living in the water that's living off organic trash. You know, every time someone throws out food, it eats it and, and stays alive like that. But then there's also these walls, and, and that's, I, th I think I also saw someone say, wouldn't the walls crush the creature? I think the creature can, like, go, like, maybe there's like an, um, what's it called? like a pipe that it can hide in that's under the floor so when it's crushed it's it's down there and then the next time it gets opened and and it's this thing like think of how easy it would have been for it to just go directly you know they shoot and then they just find a new place but no first there's this garbage you know trash compactor they almost get crushed they almost get eaten and then, like, they're swinging across and all this stuff because it was a way for more adventure. And, yeah, I, I really appreciate I mean, the trash compactor took a while to film, and it was, like, I hopefully it didn't smell as bad as it does in-universe, but they're still, like, they're standing there in water, which gets cold if you don't heat it you know poor Mark Hamill has to get dra dragged under and then fight his way up you know all this stuff but it's a good scene it's it's fun it's unexpected you know it's it's such a clever like of course it's gonna lead to something like a garbage thing you know you you can't be like it's it's almost kind of a parody of all those movies where there just happens to be a passage that you can take that's big enough for a human being 
But no, in you know, if you if you take a passage like that, it leads to the garbage. Yeah. And C-3PO lies convincingly to several stormtroopers, avoids him and R2-D2 being captured. And R2 stops the closing of the garbage chute, and the three human, the, their celebrations, their shouts of celebrations, are mistaken by C-3PO as cries of pain. Some might call it an obvious joke. I think they deliver it very well. It's just, it's it's kind of fun. Like, when you hear them, they're like, ah, ah. And he's like, oh, my my friends, I, I was too slow to run. Oh, curse these mechanical, you know, I was too slow. <laughs> and then they, they're like, no, C3PO, 3 you saved us. And I think, is that one of the times where 3 says, thank the maker, which is such a great, because is a robot really going to say thank God? He's going to say thank the maker because... To, to him, the main, you know, the people who make robots are like gods, so, yeah. And Han Solo runs after the stormtroopers and then realizes just how many are in the room they were running. Let's see. And, you know, I mean, he, he may have plot armor, but even that thing has limits. And there's stormtroopers come, like, at first there's, like... Luke and, and Leia are like here and up here there's this you know there's a doorway and there's like three stormtroopers and they manage to shoot one of them but then the others are still shooting but then behind them the door starts opening and there's stormtroopers there and so they I, I don't even know what the thing he uses is supposed to be for and I don't need to but just like he gets it out and swing you know attaches it she holds on to him and he swings across. When George Lucas said he wanted swashbuckling, he wasn't kidding. Swinging across like that is right out of a, out of a pirate movie. Swinging across the chasm. Ah, one second. I need to deal with this real quick. Fair enough. This was more than one second. Um, it's almost there, though. There we go. I long ago swore never to let gravity defeat me. Let's see. Open the blast doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't let you do that. And we're told that in 30 minutes the Death Star will be in range. Excellent job at the stakes. Luke and the other pilots don't have very much time. Although when they did that, I thought that the the 30, like, they say 30 minutes, and then it says 30 on the display. I thought that meant that the number that it says there is how many minutes are left before they're in range. But then later, the, the numbers don't correspond at all. So I guess it's something else, and they just, like, correlation does not equate causation, so... I like that every so often, despite all the bickering, the characters do express that they really care about each other. Han tells Luke, C-3PO tells R2-D2. Like, when Han tells Luke, may the Force be with you, you know, like, he... Yeah, he didn't have to do that, but he... Yeah. And C-3PO tells R2, don't get killed out there. You don't want my life to get boring, do you? And multiple times after Darth Vader seemingly killed Ben, Luke hears his voice. I guess when he said that he would become more powerful than Darth could possibly imagine, he meant that he was headed to the ADR booth. Which, to be fair, is the... You know, that's where you get the last say. The climax is very exciting. So many of the fighters are destroyed by TIE fighters. So many, so many of the X-Wings and Y-Wings are, yeah. And now there's only three minutes before the Death Star can destroy the Rebel base. And now it's only one minute and 30 seconds. And Vader is almost ready to shoot. Like, you know, all the others have been 
And, you know, Obi-Wan basically waited until the last possible second to tell Luke not to use the targeting computer. I guess he appreciates dramatic timing. And the Death Star starts the process of firing on the Rebel base. And Luke manages to blow it just, blow it up just in time. Like, they were powering up the Death Star laser, pressing the buttons. We're talking just a few seconds. I guess this is the Star Wars equivalent of disarming the bomb with one second left on the timer. And Han shows up in the Millennium Falcon, manages to get the TIE Fighters away from Luke. It really is exhilarating here at the end, seeing the others happy that Han showed that he doesn't really care, that he doesn't only care about profit. C-3PO expressing concern about R2-D2. Since none of those audience members speak Wookiee, and right after Chewie says something in Wookiee, the audience at the medal ceremony all cheer, I guess there's some tiny chance that what he said translates roughly to, please clap. And that is it for this section. Moving on to the next section. Entitled, Notes Taken Before Watching. Yeah, I, I really love that in the original version, I really wish it was still very easily accessible. Han shot first. You know, he didn't wait for Greedo to shoot. It's such a cowboy western thing to do. It's perfect for him. And I I suppose, yeah, if I give the title, that's technically a spoiler, but there are there's at least one a a actual western out there where one of the you know, good guys, anti-heroes at, at worst, not one of the bad guys, does that. You know, he hides, a, he hides a revolver under the table in a, a saloon, and he shoots the other guy. He doesn't, you know, ra yeah, rather than a duel. The, you know, the thing you expect in a Western is an honorable duel where it's a matter of who can draw the fastest. But no, he shoots without giving the other guy a chance, and that's characterization, and, I, you know, apparently it was also that, like, some, was it, like, some of the members of the MPAA said that you can't show the film to children if one of the good guys shoots, you know, the other guy before, yeah. It's, it's one of the very first things we see him do, and it really gives you a sense of who he is. So apparently some people didn't realize that the Galactic Empire were fascists before the sequel trilogy. I think the reason that Lucas didn't spell it out more the way that they do in the sequel trilogy is that to him it was just so obvious because it was such a recent memory still. You know, 1977, World War II, let's see. I guess World War II has, had just been over for 30 years so you know it was still <sighs> people hadn't forgotten you know what fascists were like and that fascists were the bad guys in World War II. So I'm just gonna highlight some things that this movie, I'm not gonna be talking about the sequels in, in this one, not only episode 4. Some things this movie yeah some things that in this movie that indicate that the Galactic Empire are fascists. They commit genocide, blowing up Alderaan. You know, like, it, it would be one thing if they were like... the... the... ah, what's the word? Like, why, why didn't they choose an uninhabited planet? If, if what they're saying is, look, we have a bigger gun than you, why do you need to kill people with it? And, you know, the... the let's see, the... the there were... Ah, let me think. Yeah, that's actually yeah. By the time it gets blown up, we actually we're told that it's it's not the rebel base. 
the rebel base is on a different planet, and Tarkin is like, well, that other planet isn't going to be a good enough demonstration, so we're going to blow up this planet full of innocent civilians, you know, because they wanted to communicate that they're, you know, yeah. To, you know, that actually does, that is somewhat reminiscent of America blowing up, you know, using two nukes on Japan. But then, you know, that, I'm, I would be surprised if George Lucas didn't think that that was the wrong thing to do. So, again, you know, blowing up civilians, that's what the bad guys do. That's not something the good guys do, as communicated by this movie. Other fasc fascist traits, they go door to door and demand to see if you are hiding people who are not expected to be armed, but are political enemies of the Galactic Empire. Think of how easy it would have been to have at least one stormtrooper claim to someone whose house they were searching that the droids they're looking for are armed and dangerous. At that point, they're basically carrying out police work, although, you know, Obviously, it's still a violation of human rights to go door to door without warrant, but then it appears to be a fairly lawless land on Tatooine. But yeah, they they don't they never claim that the droids are dangerous. We never once hear someone say the droids could kill people. Just they they've stolen information that we think it might be, you know, like even like hypothetically, even if you wanted to say. You know the the ah, what's the word? Right, right. Even you know if if you want to say well, you know of course they're going to be hard on R two B two. He's a spy. He you know he the the to them he's he's a spy. And spies are sometimes treated very harshly during wartime by the other countries if they're caught. But how does that justify going door to door in like you know, there's just yeah, it's a it's a fascist trait. The soldiers are called stormtroopers, just like the Nazis called their some of their soldiers. Their leadership are exclusively old white men. You know, the diversity exists in the heroes and the general population, but not the Galactic Empire. They got rid of the Senate, which at least one Imperial officer explicitly says, you know, as long as the Senate is around, there, you know, someone there will criticize these actions of theirs, and that's clearly why they got rid of the Senate. You know, they, they disbanded democracy. Spoiler for Attack of the Clones. I mean, even if you don't want to go with the prequel trilogy canon of all the stormtroopers are clones, which obviously makes it even more explicit, they are still completely without individuality, which is what fascists want out of their soldiers. Like, if you're not a fascist and a military man working on it, you realize something completely wrong, you can help prevent, make a mistake, you know, hopefully you would want to hear them out, but fascists don't want individuality. No more spoilers for Attack of the Clones. There, there might be more that's, you know, yeah, that's what I could come up with, and especially was in this movie, and, yeah, so, that is everything, so, holy crap, yeah. What can I, this video got long because I had a lot to say. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page and one or two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show. These days it's What If. And currently, the reviews and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, not always quite this long and detailed. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.